Hello, everyone, and welcome to another webinar with the Canadian Association of Social Workers. As always, I'm so happy that you are here and joining us today from wherever you are, wherever you're at. I'm sure that there's a lot of you that are still adapting to unconventional ways of practice as we are here. So thank you for taking the time to join us today and, and sit in on another amazing webinar uh, presentation that we get. We have another veteran webinar presenter with us today who presented with us earlier. Uh, hopefully you had a chance to view the first webinar we did with Dr. Kolick. We, that was um, a little bit earlier in the year actually. And so this is part two where we get to dive into a little bit more of the logistics around arts-based mindfulness and doing some arts-based mindfulness for our clients. So we're so excited to have this webinar today and to be joined again by Dr. Kolick. We're so lucky and thankful. Uh, a couple little housekeeping notes as always. If you're new to the system, welcome. We're so happy to have you. If you are a old time uh, webinar viewer with us, just hang on uh, as we do some housekeeping notes. Everything that you should need during this presentation will be in the bottom widget section. Uh, that includes certificate of attendance, which will need about 40 minutes. If you are having troubles opening it, try moving some things around on your screen. Uh, we do tend to have different screen sizes, so sometimes when we open things, we just need to move everything around so that we can see it uh, a little bit more clearly. Same thing with the Q&A. Please type your questions at any moment during the presentation. I compile all of your questions, and we do a bit of a formal Q&A at the end, so don't worry about waiting till the end to ask your questions. I'm happy to, to compile them as we go and as they come to your head. As well, please take a minute to look at the welcome and housekeeping widget. A lot of times if you have an issue, you may just need to refresh your page um, and that should all be listed in our welcome and housekeeping widget. I think that's it for today, aside from the fact that I did want to just quickly note that the CSW has launched a peer-to-peer -peer support group on Facebook for clinicians and practicing social workers to come and, and share their thoughts, experiences, and expertise during these crazy times. Uh, so please, if you want to look at your resource section there, you're more welcome to request to join and we will approve you. Uh, if you would like, you're welcome to post anything in there and that group is really for you and for our members to share what it's like to be a social worker during these times. So I think with all that said, like I said, please engage with us in the Q&A and, and, and please go to the Facebook page. Uh, we're excited to have you. And obviously, as always, we want to share knowledge and experience and expertise. So now on to our webinar presenter. Uh, we are so lucky, as I said, to be doing a part two series on arts-based mindfulness. The first webinar was so well received and we just had a lot more info we really needed to dive into. Um, and this is something, again, like I've said, uh, I know a lot of us aren't in physical practice right now, but we are making notes and tips and tools and tricks for when we do get back into it. Uh, and so please, if you're a student right now, think about different ways that you can incorporate this into your practice when you get back uh, into the field. So with all that being said, I'm going to introduce our webinar presenter. You should have had this introduction in the first webinar, but I'll give you a refresher because I'm so excited to be joined by Dr. Colick. Diana obtained her PhD at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia, and her MSW degree at the University of Toronto. Diana is a practicing clinical social worker with 20 plus years of experience and has been a board member at the local chapter of the Ontario Association of Social Workers since 2005. At Laurentian University, she is a core member of the research group ECHO, Evaluating Children's Health Outcomes, and she is the SSHRC lead for Laurentian University. Diana's research investigates the effectiveness of arts-based mindfulness for groups that work for the improvement of resilience and self-concept, particularly in marginalized children and youth. The 12-week arts-based mindfulness group program she and her team have developed is called, have developed, is called HAP, Holistic Arts-Based Programming. So thank you so much, Diana. Welcome back. We're so excited to have you. Well, thanks. Thanks for, um, thanks for inviting me back. Okay, so um, like Alexandra said, this uh, webinar builds on the first one. And uh, the way I've organized it is I've taken the questions um, from the first one and organized it uh, according to the questions. So let's just get into things, shall we? Um, okay, so these were 
uh, these were the questions people were wondering. Um, so I want to start with the one that's bolded. I'm wondering if there are any limitations for social workers who do not hold an arts therapy degree. Um, so, you know, without a degree in art therapy, you definitely shouldn't be saying that you're doing art therapy or that you're an art therapist. Um, so language is really important. And um, that's why I use the language of arts-based methods because uh, arts-based methods is a really broad term that includes things like games, uh, experiential activities, music, movement, as well as arts and crafts. So I really uh, strongly encourage um, social workers and social work students to be creative and to use arts-based methods uh, for a variety of reasons, but because you know the methods are effective and they're appropriate, um, especially for some populations like marginalized youth, um, and even uh, for some cultures like indigenous cultures and, and other cultures where art uh, is really important. And the thing is that researchers are even increasingly using these methods to um, engage people and collect data. So yeah, I think social workers have the skill. I think they have the knowledge and the education they need to be able to, to um, incorporate more creativity uh, into their practices. So I guess the, the only thing I would say is like when you're using creative methods, it's obviously for a purpose, right? And you need to be clear about the, the purpose, why you're using a particular method. And um, I always think about arts-based methods basically as tools and processes that enable people to develop an understanding of themselves, um, express themselves in ways that aren't possible through talking um, and, and to learn new skills. So, um, you know, I'll give you a really simple example. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was um, uh, meeting with a new client and this is a, a person I hadn't met with in, in person. So we were meeting over video and I could see uh, she was obviously in her in her bedroom, and I could see behind her she had all these pictures. It looked it looked like paintings that she had done, um, and they looked anime like like a lot of young people um, uh, like anime, and you see that in their paintings and drawings. You see that sort of style of the big eyes and the sort of larger head, and and so of course I I asked her about that. Um, and we had a conversation about some of the drawings because some of them were really interesting. Um, and then I asked her to do uh, something for me before our next session. Um, so to me, like that just seems like common sense that if you if that's right in front of you, that you would ask about it and that you would you would somehow make that part of your work, right? So that's a simple example, but. Yeah, so why why wouldn't we um, be, be using these methods? Okay, so um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, oh, sorry. Before I go ahead, I also wanted to, because um, it relates to the question, sort of just put out a caution around uh, teaching mindfulness-based practices because, you know, first of all, it's not gonna appeal to everybody and it's not a panacea, right, for all of our challenges. Um, and if, particularly if you're working with people who have suffered trauma, um, you know, some people definitely need to learn some grounding and containment techniques before they might be comfortable doing meditations or focusing on their breath, right? So Burroughs is um, a researcher um, in Australia, and she's written quite a bit about incorporating mindfulness into education. And, uh, and what she's found is that, first of all, we don't talk a lot about the drawbacks of doing this, but what she's found is that um, for some students who are dealing with emotionally charged issues, um, the meditation actually makes them feel worse. And that makes sense if you think about mindfulness as um, a practice of looking internally and being in touch with what's there. Right, that that makes perfect sense. So, just a caution about that. Um, yeah. So you know, so if you have clients, if you're in classes, you might just want to simply let people know that if they start to feel overwhelmed or anxious, that they can 
certainly check out uh, of a meditation or something like that. Okay. Um, okay. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to do a lot of review, but just to sort of remind you, I guess a lot of the, the, well, the activities and a lot of what I'm saying today comes from our research, um, our research looking at the effectiveness of HAP. So just to remind you, HAP is a, is a strengths-based program um, and it's got three important components to it, the mindfulness, the art space piece, and the group work. Um, so the goals of HAP are to teach um, people mindfulness, to help them improve their self-awareness, uh, to help them develop their self-compassion and empathy, and to shore up their strengths. And I'm gonna say a little bit later, I'm gonna say a bit more later on about um, strengths. So we'll come back to that. Okay. Uh, so HAP and resilience. So the kinds of things that we have found is that HAP um, can help participants develop aspects of their resilience, uh, like self-awareness, emotion regulation, uh, self-esteem, improved mood. Um, definitely participants in HAP enjoy the program, it, the art space piece makes it, I think, really non-threatening and inclusive and fun. Um, and again, this relates to the first question around uh, being creative. You know, we know that creative methods have a long history um, and certainly have been part of helping professions and particularly when we're looking at youth, because we understand that youth communicate a lot of their thoughts and feelings non-verbally through creative activity. Right, and the methods are very engaging, which is super important. And the most important element of a program might be that people actually enjoy practicing what you're teaching them, because then they're more likely to continue to do that, right, in their in their life outside of the program. Okay, so an arts based approach, right, focused on strengths, um, can also accommodate a lot of diversity in capacities. Um, and create and can create a safe context uh, where people who feel vulnerable over time can start can then start to take risks to share aspects of their lives, thoughts, and feelings. Okay, so strengths-based approach. I think um, you know this is really ubiquitous in social work, um, but you know sometimes um, we don't. You know, we don't uh, articulate really um, how that guides the language we use and the practices we do, um, but definitely for us in HAP, and I think uh, if you're facilitating mindfulness, doing it from an arts-based approach, it, it, um, it helps be, people be successful, right? It helps them learn and practice these skills and capacities, and that's really, really important. Okay, uh, this is just a really simple example of how you, you know, how we sort of begin to, um, uh, well, let me, no, sorry, let me back up. What this, what you're looking at here, this is the uh, group rules from one of the groups, from, from one of our HAP groups. So in the first session, we always uh, talk to the participants about what kind of group would they like to have. Um, so what we do, because especially with, um, you know, younger children, you, what, the kinds of things you get are often like, don't yell, don't run, you know, everything's like, don't, don't, don't. So right from the beginning, we, we try to get them to change that language. And instead of all these kind of negative things, it's more about, um, like you can see, be yourself, you know, try your best, have faith in others, right? So right from the get go, the language we're, we're using and promoting is, is um, strengths-based, right? Have fun, listen to others and take turns, those kinds of things. Okay, so let's move on to uh, this question. Can you tell me what HAP activities are best suited for younger kids, grade three students? So um, I don't know if it, it, it might sound strange to some of you, but the, the program you can use the program with a wide variety of ages and children and adults so for those like you know for those of you who don't know um in this book which is there's a link to it in the last slide 
the, the program is, is here, the 12 sessions with all the activities, the outline of the program. So you can pick it up and you can do it. Um, and we've done HAP with kids from eight to 17, 18, and we've also done it with adults. So we've done it with women in a transition house. We've done it with um, adults looking for mental health services. Uh, we've done it with university students a few times. We've done it with teachers. So it works um, for all of those populations. Th what you need to do is modif sometimes like slightly modify the activity so they're appropriate for the age that you're working with, right? So I'm, I'm going to give you some examples. So, um, so for example... When, if you're working with uh, students in grade three, so the younger children, um, what we do when we first are teaching them how to kind of focus on their breath is we use very short little guided imagery. So this is a, a picture of one of my favorite books, and I've been using this for many years. But I really like it because the, the guided imageries are short. And if you, I'm sorry, I don't have the book, so I can't show you, but the, the illustrations are really colorful and really nice. And so kids like this book. Uh, like when you show it to them, they like it. And um, in the past, when we uh, have worked with younger kids, they've actually asked for photocopies of some of the guided imagery so that they could read them themselves, like before they go to bed and stuff. So I, I recommend this book to um, parents, definitely, when I work with parents. But anyway, so... So this is an example of like a guided imagery we would use for younger children. Obviously for adults, you can use more traditional sort of meditations. They can be longer. Um, so you just have to adapt for the, per the person or the people you're working with. Um, and then the other thing we do is because, you know, some children, like they don't have the ability to sit still. They're, they, they, uh, this is what they have to learn, you know, this ability to, to focus internally. So we might uh, say, okay, we're going to read you a little guided imagery, and we would get them to sculpt out of clay what they're imagining as they're listening, right? Or you can even do it with drawing. You could ask them to draw a picture of what. So this is great because you're getting them to practice paying attention to something that they're listening to, but you're also getting them to use their imagination, which is really important um, for a lot of children. Because if you can't imagine a different possibility for yourself, then it's going to be pretty hard to get there, right? So th these are just a couple pictures of, of things that kids have sort of imagined as they're, as they're listening. So this is a, a good strategy, I think, for children who are having a hard time sitting still and paying attention. Um, okay, so another example would be uh, mindful eating, right? So um, there are there are traditional mindful scripts that you can find, um, and you can sort of take somebody through a script uh, if you want to do a mindful eating exercise. Or you can, uh, what we usually do is have more of a conversational dialogue about mindful eating. Um, so... Uh, today I'm going to read you um, little parts of, of actual transcripts um, from our work. So these are, uh, this is another, this is a book that I wrote. It was published in 2010. So um, that's, where, that's where this is coming from. But so this is an example of a conversation between a facilitator and a younger boy around mindful eating just to sort of give you a sense of how you might, how you might do it. So imagine you've got, they've got a, a bunch of granola bars that they're looking at. So the different types of granola bars. So Tim is the facilitator and Harry is the, uh, the youth. So, okay, so Tim says, do you wanna try it with a granola bar? Okay, we're gonna take our time and we're gonna think about all the things that we normally miss because we eat food too fast, right? So first of all, we have to decide what granola bar are we gonna have? There's lots of different kinds. So already you're being mindful because you're thinking about what we want right now, what's gonna taste the best. What else are you thinking about? And Harry says, which one I'm gonna choose? 
And Tim says, yeah, but what factors do you think are gonna go into that choice? What's helping, uh, what's gonna help you make that decision? And Harry says, what they taste like? I don't know. And Tim says, to me, it's gonna be what they look like. I think maybe this one might taste better. And Harry says, raspberry. You wanna try the raspberry? This is big. So what else would we do if we were being totally mindful? And what else would we do before we even opened it if we really wanted to enjoy it? Sit down, sit down, yes. I might turn it over in my hands. I might feel what's inside the wrapper and imagine what it's gonna look like. Is it gonna look like the picture? Maybe that big fat raspberry on the picture. You're thinking it's gonna be like chewing into a nice big juicy raspberry. What else? What else would you think about if you were thinking really mindfully? The stuff on the bottom? Yeah, the stuff on the bottom, what's that? You're smelling it, yeah. You're seeing if you can smell raspberries inside, right? Can you? There's yogurt at the bottom. Let's see if there is. So then they open it up. Smell it. Harry says, smell it. Oh, so you notice the smell already. Okay, so normally if I was eating a granola bar, it would be gone by now. But if we're eating mindfully and we really want to enjoy it, what are you going to think about now? Okay, so now you notice the chocolate chip on mine. What did you notice about yours? I just saw you go like this. Does it feel sticky or something? It is sticky. Yeah, did it feel sticky when you picked it up? It feels chewy. Okay, there's something happening in my mouth while I'm looking at this. And Harry says, tasting it, drool. Yeah, I'm starting to drool a bit because I'm thinking about what it's going to taste like. It's going to taste good. Okay, now should we eat it? And Harry says, slowly. Slowly, okay. So normally I would take one bite and then two bites. How could we try to eat it differently? And Harry says, one bite. Okay, one bite at a time. And I'm even going to do better than that. I'm going to break it up into small pieces. It's a beautiful chocolate chip. Ready? And Harry says, I'm checking the taste. And Tim says, how many times do you think we should chew? 10, count to 10. Okay, count to 10. You tell me when 10 is up. Okay, so let's swallow. What did you think about that first bite? And Harry says, it's good. There's almonds. Good thing I'm not allergic. And Tim says, is there anything else you noticed about it from that first bite? Was it everything you thought it was going to be? It was chewy. Okay, let's take 20 chews this time. Take your time to swallow. So, you know, and it goes on, but but you see how um, Harry really, really gets into it and even starts um, helping the facilitator eat the, the granola bar mindfully, right? Okay, so I don't know, was that, that, was that useful? Or? Yes, definitely. I, I just have some people wondering what the title and name of that book was. Oh, this one, it's called uh, Arts Activities for Children and Young People in Need. Awesome. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, okay, so here's another example. So this is an activity um, called uh, We're All Connected. So um, basically what happens is you, every everybody uh, represents themselves using a wooden clothespin. So they decorate it um, to symbolize who they are. And then these hang uh, in the group room and eventually they decorate envelopes with their names on it, uh, which is, and that's where the warm fuzzies go every session. But, so here's an example um, of this activity in a group we did uh, quite a few years ago with uh, Indigenous women. Uh, but here's, here's so here's something, the, so here's one Indigenous woman explaining her clothespin to the group. So, you know, she says the colors represented something that I was feeling in my life. The red is because I love lots. I tell my daughter all the time how much I love her. And the green represented the jealousy I tend to have when it comes to my relationships. The blue is because I was sad. I have lost a few good men in my life this year. Then being so young made me realize that I don't want to die tomorrow and leave this world miserable. And when I did the purple, it meant being healthy and happy. The pipe cleaner, I have big issues with the way I look. Then the arms here were because I always have my arms open. I'm always helping somebody. And then the black was just because my hair is long and dark. Not really knowing what I was feeling while I was doing the exercise, wow, I guess I was feeling a lot more than I thought when I was making it. 
So I really like this example because I think it shows um, just uh, how much information you can get from a really simple activity, right? So if you're going around and, and doing a sort of get to know you um, uh, process, like there's no way if you just asked this woman, tell us about yourself that you would have got all this information, right? But this is obviously going to be way more sophisticated than what you're going to get from a younger person, right? So that's the other, so you can do the same activities with a bunch of different ages, but the discussions you're going to have about them and what you're going to get from them is obviously going to be age appropriate, right? So um, again, with the younger kids, um, the activities tend to move much quicker. So, uh, so if you look in the book and you, and you look at HAP and you go, okay, you know, what are we supposed to do in session two? And you look at all the exercises with adults, you might not get through everything, right? Because adults have more of an ability and they might want to have more of discussion about a particular activity, right? So that's okay. You don't have to worry about that. But um, typically with the younger kids, things move, move along much more quicker. And often the discussion you have is happening during the activity rather than after, right? Because when kids are done something, they're ready to move on, right, to the next thing. So you see the process is a little bit different. Um, you have to make some modifications, and, but, but basically you can, you can do the same activities. And this is just another, I'm just going to show you this really quickly. Um, one of the activities we always do is we get the group to construct a, a group symbol. Um, so this is from a group of education students. Um, so their symbol is the thought, like the thought jar was really important for them. So, uh, you know, they call this keep calm and thought jar on. And each one of the members is a flower. Uh, that's how they represented themselves. This is a, a really fun one from uh, a group of uh, 11, 12-year-old girls. So they've got the half sun, and then each one of them is sort of a planet kind of rotating around the sun. They were all really interested in, in outer space. So, uh, so that's great. That really kind of symbolizes that group. And then this is one from one of uh, the groups that we did at the local transition house. So these, again, the women are the flowers around the stop sign, and then they put around the stop sign all the things they wanted to stop, like negative self-judgment and all that kind of stuff. Okay. All right. So, um, okay. So then we had a question um, around, should kids or youth be calm uh, before trying the exercises? So, and what, what do you suggest for kids with high energy? Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't think it's realistic to expect kids to be calm. Um, you know, especially if you're doing group work, like sometimes they come and they're so excited to see each other. And, uh, sometimes they come with really high energy. So, um, you know, but that's the, the beauty of, uh, coming at this from an art based approach because, you, the activities can be really active, right? So if you have a really high energy group, you can start with something maybe that's going to help them settle, um, or you can just work with that energy. So uh, I know in the last um, session I gave an example of the. I, I remember this was in the this was in the presentation saying that sometimes we um, we use tai chi movements to help kids focus on their breathing because they need something more active. They have to be up and moving. Um, this is uh, painting to music is, uh, you know, this is a good activity if people ha like have energy, but it's also good to energize people. Like if people have been sitting for a while and, and they need to get up. So uh, this is really simple. You just get four or five sort of one minute segments of different kinds of music and you play it and everybody can paint, uh, they can paint how that music makes them feel. So in this picture, you'll see that we've got it split into one, two, four quadrants. So this obviously represents four different songs, but everybody's um, painted like, so you can see in the first one, obviously whatever that music was, 
made everybody feel something similar because they've kind of got these wavy lines, right? Um, but this, you know, this activity, the purpose of this is just to help people start um, start recognizing their feelings, start being able to identify what they're feeling and express that. So what we do in HAP is we often do this activity earlier in the group and they do it individually. And then as the group progresses, we move to doing more things together as a group. So this, this one is obviously done uh, as a group. And then uh, this is another um, example of what you can do if you've got kids who are really active, maybe they need to run around, maybe they need to go outside. Uh, we call, it's just a hide and seek, but we call it camouflage. So what you can do is, um, you know, when, when the kids go outside, you can ask them to really pay attention and to be really mindful of what they're seeing wherever they're hiding. And then you can have a conversation about it when you come back in inside. So, uh, so I have another, I'm going to read you another little, this one's not as long, but this is another little, this is a group discussion about camouflage once the group came back uh, into the room. So, um, yeah, so, well, first of all, the facilitator kind of explained to the boys that, you know, when they hide, um, well, he's saying, you know, I'll just read what he says. He says, one reason I really like to hide now is I use it to slow down my thoughts. When I'm really close to the ground, usually hiding, I can see things that I normally would just walk over, right? I can see the little ants, little small pieces of gravel. I can see the edge of a leaf. I can see how jagged the leaf is or if the rocks are loose or if the ants are moving. Those are some things that you can pay special attention to when you're trying to slow down your thoughts and be mindful. So then they went out and played that. They came back in and he says, do you guys think you can take a crack at that question that I just asked? Which senses do you use most when your eyes are closed in that game? So I guess obviously at some point he must have asked the boys to cl close their eyes when they were hiding. So one of the boys says, you're hearing. And the other boy says, gut feeling. I use my hearing and my mind. Yeah, I use my gut seeing my mind. Then Tim says, which one do you use the most when your eyes are closed? And Paul says, hearing. Uh, so Tim says, so what kinds of things were you listening for? Uh, and one of the boys says, I go like this, you know, makes the sound of the wind. When you guys run past me, you, you go like this and the wind comes at you. And Tim says, I was trying to be like an animal who had just moved through the bush without making any noise. Didn't I do that? And one of the boys says, I never saw you. And Tim says, you could hear me? And one of the boys said, especially when you jumped over the bush. Oh, when I jumped over the bush, I must have made a lot of noise. What things did you notice the most when you were hiding? And, and one of the kids says, I seen the grass like close. Another boy says, I saw dead leaves, a lot of ants in an ant hole. And then I seen a big, and one of the boys says, that must have burned if one bit you. And then someone says, I saw a chickadee in the tree. I seen it too, right? Okay. All right. I hope that makes sense. But, but see, so you're using, basically, you're using, you know, we're using a, an activity that kids like to play, but we're trying to get them to do it in a really mindful uh, way. And often, you know, what, what happens with camouflage is the kids will bring, they'll bring rocks and they'll bring often sticks back to the room, which they then want to paint or decorate or whatever, which is totally fine. Then we just incorporate that into some other activity. Okay. So hopefully that, that sort of gives you some, uh, some tips on what to do with that. So, um, okay. Then the next question was, I'm wondering if how narrative approaches are incorporated, is there a discussion around children's experiences or is the HAP program focused specifically on mindfulness and art space? So uh, yes, definitely, uh, definitely. There's lots and lots of conversation about um, a wide, wide variety of issues. So the, the arts based, so every activity um, has a goal to either uh, teach a practice or teach a concept or promote, like, say, group cohesion 
Um, so, and, and the different activities will bring up, will, they'll bring up the conversations that participants want to have, right? So a lot of times, like a lot of the youth we've worked with, um, you know, they've had trauma in their life. Um, so that will often come up. So as, as youth are sort of getting more comfortable with identifying what they're feeling, um, and they're able to, to express that, then they will want to have conversations. So the, I think, I think this is part of the effectiveness of coming from an arts-based approach that, that, you know, the participants will talk about what they want to talk about. And when they, when they, um, you know, when they see that this is a, a safer place for them, this is their group, they have a sense of belonging, um, they will definitely bring the issues they want to talk about. So, yeah, so for sure, for sure. So I have one more little, um, do you want me to read you sort of part of a conversation? One more? I never know if, I never know if reading the transcripts is helpful or not, but okay, so uh, this is one about, um, this actually will show you a bit about how to talk somebody through an activity too. So, um, so this is, um, in this example, the facilitator and one of the girls is, t is talking about her picture of herself as a river. This is not the picture, uh, but this is an example of what you're looking at of somebody who drew themselves as a river. So this is similar to the activity, draw yourself as a tree. If people don't want to do a tree, then they can draw themselves as a river, right? Um, so this is this is a conversation they're having about about her picture. So generally, what would happen in HAP is like people would do the activity, and then ideally we would have some sharing and some conversation about what people have created. So, okay, so Barb is the facilitator, and Martha is the um, the youth. So Barb says. So in, in her picture, you'll have to imagine Martha drew um, three, di three different rivers and some had bridges on them. Okay. So Barb says, so what do those br bridges represent? Uh, and Martha says, this, this river represents my past. This one, the longest one, is my past. This one, she's pointing to the second river, is the present. And this one, she's pointing to the third river, is the future. So Barb says, how come the past is the longest one? Martha says, because this one represents sexual abuse, abuse by my father and my mother. So Barb says, so you feel like there are a lot of things in the past that have happened? Yes. I find it interesting how it's not connected to the future one. And Martha says, I'm glad that it's not connected. So Barb says, so you did that on purpose then? And Martha says, yes. And Barb says, so you see it as a separate part now, right? And Martha says, yes. So Barb says, so are you on this piece of the bridge right now? She points to a bridge on the river representing the present. You feel like you are here working toward it? And Martha says, yeah. So Barb says, what's on the present bridge? And Martha says, my life now. And so Barb says, what are the really important things to you now? And Martha says that I have a home, that I'm safe, that I have a nice school to go to. And Barb says, yes. And then Martha says, this present river was also supposed to be long because there are some things happening at my school that have gone wrong. And Barb says, oh, so you wish that bridge could be a little bit longer, but it's not as long as you like it. So how do you think that you could make that bridge longer? And Martha says, um, just by being me. And then Barb says, so if you think that you continue to be you, then the next time you are to draw this, then this bridge would be getting longer. And Martha says, yes. And Barb says, what happens as the present bridge and the future bridge get longer? And Martha says, they join up. And Barb says, oh, then those will be connected. Interesting. What about the past bridge? Is that going to be connected? And Martha says, nope. And Barb said, it's always going to be on its own. So is it going to change in size? And Martha says, yeah, it's going to go smaller and smaller as time goes on. And Barb says, as these two, the present and the future rivers connect, then they will become one long river. Then they will go down and down and down. So what kinds of things do you see on the future bridge? 
And Martha says, all my life is going to change. And Martha said, or and then Barb says, so what's going to change? Give me an example. What would be on that bridge? Are those your goals and things that you're working towards? And Martha says that if I grow up, I get married, have kids, right? And then the conversation sort of goes on about, about sort of her goals and, you know, stuff like that. But anyway, but that maybe gives you a little example of sort of a conversation you can have, you know, based on a drawing that, that somebody's done. So, yeah, um, for sure, for sure, there's lots of sometimes, um, you know, difficult conversations that come up. Sometimes uh, they're not all sort of difficult, but um, definitely they're, they're relevant to whatever the youth want to, to bring up and discuss. Okay, so, um, uh, okay, good. We're almost, uh, we're almost at quarter two because I wanted to, to have time for some questions. So, um, but yeah, I just want to say sort of like moving forward um, that, you know, I think we need to do better um, in terms of listening to youth about what they want and they need. And we've certainly learned that, uh, like, I don't know about you, but most of the youth we work with tell us, like, they don't want to go to counseling, right? They don't want to talk about their problems. But what they need are spaces where they can join with peers and build positive relationships. So a lot of youth are socially excluded and really don't feel like they belong. Um, and then when they, when they have this kind of opportunity, then guess what? They do talk about their problems and, uh, and, and they get something out of that for sure. So, uh, yeah, I'm always surprised how many of the youth we work with really don't have adults in their life, um, who are going to listen to them and, and validate them and, and they don't have places where they can be authentic. So that's really, really important. Um, and you know, I've become a really, really big advocate of group work. Um, through doing this research and seeing uh, what kids are getting out of this program. Um, I, I know a lot of students, if they're students listening, um, really often don't have a sense of the importance of group work. They think it's something that maybe you do uh, as a last resort. But a lot of times, um, this is exactly what kids need. Um, you know, uh, for example, if I'm working with a youth one-on-one -on -one and their their challenge is um, uh, creating good friendships or peer relationships, that kind of thing, there's there's not, you know, there's only so much I can do on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Like they need to have that experience and opportunity to develop those those skills. Yeah. So, and you know, as social workers, we're experts in social group work. Um, so this is this is definitely one of our areas of expertise um, and then just the the issue like i mentioned before about belonging that you know experiences experiencing a sense of belonging has its own benefits for improving resilience and self-awareness and self-esteem and and honestly i think with all this covid uh, 19 crisis uh, we're in right now i think this is going to be even more important uh, when people are allowed to come back together i think um having a, a sense of belonging and um yeah so i think that you know anyway that's what i'm anticipating that this is going to be even more relevant in the future in terms of our practice so that's uh, yeah so that's the material um i wanted to present uh there's some resources for you you can uh, follow our work on instagram facebook if you're on social media that's it. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much. I every every time we do these webinars, I feel a little bit more grounded in uh, even just own <laughs> tips for myself. I'm like, hmm, maybe I need to do some art. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to dive into some of these questions. I'm just going to quickly remind anyone if you joined us late in the introduction that you can access everything you need in the bottom widgets uh, and check or take a look at our resource list. Um, the resource list also has our Facebook peer to peer group that you're welcome to request to join. Uh, and you, we, if you have some questions that maybe we don't get to today, you can ask them in that group.
So um, I just want to start off by, uh, well, thanking you. And I, I really appreciate the reminder about group work, especially as social workers. I do think you made an excellent point about how sometimes we think group work is kind of the last resort when definitely with uh, certain, certain demographics, especially like children, it could be an incredible way to get them to open up uh, and give them, like you said, a sense of belonging. So quickly, I'll, I'll give you a, I'll give you an easy sorry. one. You had, sorry, Alexandra, can I just say for adults too, oh, like the, the adults that we've worked with have just loved this work. And a lot of them have talked about how uh, it really helped them like regain this, um, like regain this kind of creativity that maybe they had previously in their life and then have lost. But it's, you know, it's not, I just want to say it's not just for kids. Like adults mm -hmm. get a lot out of this as well and really have fun and, uh, and enjoy, you know, enjoy learning these, learning about mindfulness through this way. So, yeah. Okay. So I don't know what other people. Yeah, I don't know what other people think. Um, however, when I heard you reading the story of the, I think it was an Indigenous woman who had done the clothespin. Is that is that what it was? When yeah. I heard you reading the story about all the things that she had uh, in terms of self-awareness that she had realized when she kind of read it back to, or looked back at what she was doing, um, that is incredible. If, so, if, if I was in a counseling session and someone asked me to just talk, I don't know if I would have even come up, come up, came up with that stuff that she came up um, with. So yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, a quick, easy question is what uh, you had mentioned someone with the name Burroughs. Uh, what was the first name in terms of resources? Uh, uh, you know what? I'll look it up while you ask me another question. Okay. Awesome. Great. So um, we do have maybe a little bit of an easier one. We have some individuals wondering about how you become a HAP facilitator. Um, how do you become a HAP facilitator? Well, you know, I would say like part of the reason, um, uh, part of the reason that I really wanted to get the program published is so that other, other people could pick it up and do it. So if you, um, you know, if you are, are a social worker um, and you want to learn how to do HAP, you can just pick up the book and sort of work your way through it. I think if you read the book, uh, the, this one, Facilitating Mindfulness, um, you know, it gives you some background on mindfulness, how to practice it, uh, and then also the arts-based piece and the group work piece. So. I guess I would say like you need to you need to have your own mindfulness practice, right? Like you need to you need to be um, like you need to be doing this in your own life, and you need to understand the concepts uh, and be applying them in your own life. Because otherwise, I don't see how you're going to be able to teach the, teach that to other people, especially young people, when you have to explain things in a way that's going to make sense for them, right? So that's one yeah. thing you have to sort of, you know, get working on that. And there are lots of personal and professional benefits to do that. Um, and then the art space piece, like I really, uh, what I find in terms of training um, students to be facilitators is the hardest part is to learn the kinds of questions to ask about whatever mm -hmm. it is someone's created. And that mm -hmm. just takes practice. Like you have to, Usually when we look at something, we want to know, well, why was that that color? But that those are not effective questions to ask, particularly young people, because if you say, well, well how come that's blue? They'll just say, well, I don't know. Right. So often yeah. it's just you have to get really um, just comfortable with asking really open questions or just making comments, just saying, oh, you know, it looks like. Um, like, you know, the, the picture of the river here, I can just pull this up. Like when I look at the river, um, to me, like this is a very, it's a very full picture, right? Mm -hmm. Like this person has used the whole page, like it's all colored in and there's lots of trees. So I might just say, wow, you know, there's lots of trees, um, around your river. You know, can you tell us about that or. You know, I noticed your river is, is going off in two different directions. You know, 
what could you say about that? So just sometimes making comments about it. So you just have a kind of a conversation about it. But that, you know, that just takes practice. Um, and the more you do it, the better you get at it. And there's there's lots and lots of books. Like there's so many resources uh, these days on using arts-based methods. Like there are thousands of books. So I would say just, you know, find some good books and just read, you know, read about case examples, read about, um, and just be sort of clear about why you're getting a person to do something. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes, sometimes... Can you hear Sorry? That? Can you yeah. hear that? Okay. What? what Sorry. Is... I can't. There was well, I can't. Of... Oh, okay. There was a bunch of noise. Okay. So oh, um, just... sometimes... Um, like I was working with a, a couple um, last year and, you know, they were both highly educated people and, you know, not sort of the kinds of people you would think you're going to do you know, creative things with. But at one mm -hmm. point I just thought to myself, you know what, we have, we've got to do something different here because we were really, it was hard to kind of move them forward. So I just asked them really quickly. I said, you know, can you just play along with me and just draw what you're feeling about this relationship and they just took like a few minutes and it was amazing what they did um you know so the woman i remember she just drew like this kind of symbol like this black stuff with all these pointy things and it was sort of her representation just of i guess the rage she felt you know about mm -hmm. what was happening and then the man just drew this kind of stick figure thing with or a stick figure person with like his feet like with these huge like boots you know like almost like cement blocks mm -hmm. and he just talked about how stuck you know he felt but it was such a, a neat way for them to, ex to sort of talk in a different way about what they were feeling and it, it just yeah. really helped us um so sometimes you're lucky and it works it works even, like I said, with clients you wouldn't think it would work with. But Yeah, it's interesting. So one of the big things that we've been doing um, to try and address uh, everything, and we're lucky that this, this has been planned, this webinar has been planned for a while, but one of the things that we've been doing right now is trying to give practitioners a bunch of very different ways that you can try and incorporate different practices in with clients. So we did a... Um, uh, nature-based webinar last week. So, you know, there's a lot of people, yeah, maybe you want to think about being an ecotherapist, or maybe you do want to think about being a hat facilitator and you'll buy Dr. Collins books and you'll, you'll go ahead, or maybe you'll just incorporate some of these practices into your practice and not, you don't have to be an arts uh, therapist to ask a client, just like Dr. Collins said, um, Hey, maybe you could try this technique with me. Maybe you could try uh, drawing how you're feeling. Yeah. And it might land and it might not, right? And um, But there's definitely ways that we can start incorporating these tips and tricks into our practice. Um, and if you did want to be a hat facilitator, there uh, you have, Dr. Kolek has so many resources as well. Um, I think I pushed the audience her website in case you missed it. Uh, so you can always take a look there and you can engage with uh, us, as she had mentioned on Twitter and whatnot, mm -hmm. and see the different techniques and whatnot. Is that is that a fair thing to say, Dr. Kolek? For sure, yeah. Like I, we use we use the Facebook and the Instagram as as ways to sort of um, you know when we had groups running, I would I would post every week examples of activities that were coming out of the. Right now, I have um, I have three people from my team. They're posting. Uh, they posted some short videos on Instagram, just to, again of different activities. So. Um, you know, we had we were running groups that we had to stop in March. So we we sort of mm -hmm. wanted to post things that maybe the kids would like to see, but they're mm -hmm. totally appropriate for anybody really to watch. So and there'll be more. Uh, they're doing a few more videos that they're going to post, but and hopefully a live session. I think they're going to try to do the paint uh, paint to music as a live session at some point. So yeah, if you follow. Mm -hmm. us, um, if you follow us, then you'll you'll see that stuff. But yeah, so the mindfulness is important. The um, uh, you know read about the you know, or if you can go to a, a training workshop or something around the art, you can certainly do that. Um, 
Yeah, because like I said, social workers have training and group work. We have, you know, you have the you have the basic skills that you need, right? Yeah. Yeah, and so I I, ha I have seen a, a student commented in here saying, you know, I, I want to do group work. Um, and then I had another, uh, one of our another uh, members says, I work with teenagers and they love the group process and want me to do more of them. So uh, just like a bit of an ode to what you were saying earlier is that we really shouldn't be afraid um, of group work, even with apparently teenagers, which is very exciting to hear. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I have another one. Um, do you have any tips and tricks for how you could adopt this into an online delivery format? Have you have you been seeing anything right now as, as you've transitioned online? Something that you've been doing? Yeah, we, we haven't, um, no, I haven't thought about how to do this online. Um, and like, for example, like we've been doing HAP um, as part of my research program and we can't really, uh, we can't do a, a session online because we can't, like, we don't know if a youth is in a safe confidential space. Like, we can't, yeah. there's too many issues around confidentiality. There's too many ethical issues. Like, a youth could be participating and they might have a friend in the background that you don't see. And then the mm -hmm. other youth's um, privacy is violated, right? So there's a lot mm -hmm. of issues ethical issues around doing the group online so i ha i haven't uh i haven't really given it a lot of thought or um figured out how to do it no yeah so yeah. i'm i i'm you know there may be a, i'm sure there's a way um but we just haven't uh put our energy we haven't sort of put our energy there right now i think I think we're all trying to figure out the issues around confidentiality and ethics in terms of transitioning to online. Um, so maybe just keep it in your head in terms of the group work and activities and then going forward, maybe as I think you had mentioned, you were in account, were you in a counseling session where you saw uh, yeah. someone? Yeah. So, I mean, that's a way if you're doing one-on-one -on -one work. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like I, I had a session with a, a young person a couple of weeks ago and uh, I asked, like I gave, I asked her to, to do some activities for homework and I asked her, I said, you know, can you make sure you have some stuff to draw with? And, um, mm -hmm. and it worked, it, it worked surprisingly well, um, online. So I think, I think the one-on-one -on -one is, is totally doable. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm just not sure. I haven't really given it a lot of thought around how to do the group, but. Fair. That is fair. Um, this is maybe uh, an interesting one. Do you have any favorite mindfulness activities for yourself as a practitioner? Uh, for myself, yes. Um, I, I uh, mindfully run, um, mm -hmm. which is a, a great mindful activity for me. Um, and believe it or not, there's lots of uh, websites and even books on mindful running. <laughs> um, and yep. then... I really like, um, uh, you know, I really just like being out in the nature and like gardening for me. I'm a big gardener. Um, thankfully, I have a, a big yard with a lot of gardens. So that's a very, uh, you know, I really like to, um, that's a very grounding activity for me. But I think, I think when you've been practicing mindfulness for a long time, it really becomes um, it really becomes part of who you are, right? And mm -hmm. so it becomes a part of the way you live your life. So it's not so much something that you're, oh, I have to go do this mindful thing now. Mm -hmm. Like it's just part of the way you're living. And like for me, like I just think it's so important, particularly now with this crisis that we're in, because um, we like you know, it's, it's really important to be able to live moment to moment because um, if you get too far ahead of yourself, it just creates so much anxiety, right? And mm -hmm. you can't, it's very hard to live in this constant state of anxiety. So, you know, for me, I'm just very aware of like moment to moment. And if I'm having a low moment, then I just recognize that and I don't judge it. Right. Like I, I never judge my feelings. Right. Because I understand if you have a feeling, the point is to be curious about it, wonder about it, 
you know, express it if you need to do that. But, and to understand if you, you ride your feelings out like, out like a wave, then that moment passes and you go to another moment, right? So mm-hmm. if I if I catch myself starting to worry about something in the future, right? I notice that and I bring myself back to the present, right? So it's mm-hmm. it's uh it's um it helps it helps a lot. I think it's a, it's a really kind of effective way to live your life. And like I said, if you're having a low moment, then have you have a low moment. And it's yeah. it's understandable right now, right? That people are so we're moving in and out. I think of anxiety, low energy, and also but also good moments too, right? Definitely. And I think that we had a we had a webinar when this first started about um, trying to stay mindful during a pandemic and um, and in different ways that we can get out and 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 explore some, some, this new way of new way of life. And one of the biggest things was to feel your feelings and to take a moment and maybe if, if you, anything to, to ask yourself why you have those feelings, but that our feelings aren't meant to be compared, especially as social workers, we're not meant to compare our feelings with our clients or anything like that. Um, and that we can incorporate our own mindfulness and mindfulness techniques into our own lives as well as, um, with our clients. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, we are at an hour. Did you have any final thoughts? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't think so. I know, right? It's like anything. <laughs> yeah, I don't, um, I don't think so. I mean, I, like I said, I just think it's, it's really, really important, I think, for, you know, to just to, you know, just to practice, like to practice, like if you're learning mindfulness, you have to practice every day. Right. And so if you're learning it, just pick something you have to do anyway, just try to do it mindfully just bring your attention and your focus to it. And, um, so you don't have to add anything to your day, right. If you're feeling overwhelmed, if you feel like you have too much, I think reading for me has always been really, really important. Like, I think if you're, learning new things to be reading about them really keeps it in your conscious mind. It really helps to learn these things and make them part of your life. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. And don't, and don't, ju- I mean, like the judgment is absolutely the worst thing, the negative uh, judgment of your thoughts and feelings. And that's the worst thing people do to themselves because when you do that, you can't do anything with that feeling so it just sits there and if it sits there then it it builds up and it gets worse right so you're making things more difficult for yourself um if you're doing that so yeah totally I, I love what you said about not having to add something else to our day I think that that's a really like please take that away from this social workers online because I know that you are busy and I know that while dealing with the compounding physical psychological mental everything the stress that we're feeling right now um we're also dealing with ourselves so we're seeing it in our clients we're seeing it in ourselves so don't add a bunch of things onto your onto your task list you don't need to start headspace and start this and start that and whatever you know you can just while you're cooking dinner, try and be mindful uh, and try and check in with yourself. Or when you're reading a book, check in with yourself. When you're going for a run, check in with yourself. Uh, you don't have to go out of your way and add all these crazy things that we're going to do because we're going to be more mindful. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, that no, was a real- yeah. Yeah. Like in the, you know, in, in mindfulness, like, you know, we talk about it being um, a state or a trait, right. Or a disposition. So so the more states like if you're if you're not mindful like the the more states you have the more experiences of it you have eventually hopefully over time it becomes a a disposition right it becomes part of the way you're living your life um so it's just it's just it's just practice it's just bringing your being conscious about what you're trying to do and um and just doing it right every day but yeah it's you know to me it's um these are really important abilities and capacities that uh, we need to have, I think, to be effective practitioners, and we need to be able to facilitate for others as well. And like I said, I think going forward, this is going to be even more important. You know, yeah. So, this. Exactly. 
Yeah. Being, yeah. Being present with yourself. I'm seeing someone type in right now. So with that, I am going to close the webinar. Please, please, please. If you haven't had a chance to watch part one of this webinar series, please go watch that. It was incredible. It also gave more tips and tricks as well. So if you, if you got through this and you're going, Oh, I, I really would like something else. Uh, we have it for you. Or if you want a refresher, you can go back and, and look at that. And as well, like we had mentioned, you can access any of these supports and, and some of the stuff that we talked about uh, online through Dr. Colick's uh, website or through um, uh, Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. Uh, so with that being said, again, thank you to all of our oh. members. I know that this is a tough Yeah. Can I say, just say one more thing? Go for it. Um, it just go made me it. think of, so one of the things that I'm, one of the things I'm thinking about doing is creating like a community of practice for people who are doing half, right? So um, obviously this is going to have to be something online because I know people are doing half all over the place. Um, but so I would be really, uh, I would very much like to hear from people um, if you're doing half and if you would like to be part of a you know, a community of practice of people who are doing it. Um, I'd very much like to hear from you. So, you know, feel free to send me an email. Um, and we're just sort of trying to figure out, I'm hoping over the summer to figure out how to do this, but it would be great to hear from people what would be useful, like what would be, yeah, what would be useful, what would be helpful. Judging by um, a lot of the comments from this webinar, there's a lot of people who would like an online something to be a hat facilitator. Um, it looks like people are wanting like a, a, not even a specific training, but they just want more. So if you if you do go ahead with that, please let the CSW know, and we will disseminate with our our members because it seems like that's really definitely yeah. important. Yeah, no, we're going to do something. We just we just need to figure out. Um, I've had a student do a bunch of research on how others have formed community of practice, um, and we just need to yeah. figure out what we can do and what's gonna what's gonna work. So yes, I will let you know for sure. But that's that's one of our goals. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, judging by judging by the feedback from this presentation, you'll have a lot of eager uh, people wanting to. to and, if, and if you are doing HAP, like uh, reach out and, and let us know how you're how it's going for you. Um, and, and, and if this webinar was insightful, if this webinar did uh, discuss the things that you had expected it to discuss, we're always looking for new tips and tricks and techniques. And obviously you are. Um, oh, yes, please. I'm here. I'm seeing from our Q&A. <laughs> So yes, I think uh, I think in other words that would be that would be phenomenal. Um, so yeah, okay, thanks. All right, thank you again. Oh my gosh, we are so lucky and so fortunate. Uh, and we will, as always, be sharing anything on our Twitter related to art space mindfulness and related to anything coming out of um, HAP or anything coming out of Echo or anything. We will be sharing on our Twitter so you can follow us for that. And like we said, keep in touch with both of us and uh, we will see you next time, guys. Thanks so much. Thanks, Dr. Colic. Bye. Bye.